Hey everyone, good to see you this afternoon. Welcome to Trail Talk, Oklahoma State Symbols Volume 8. That's right, we have so many state symbols and I have some very interesting ones to share with you today. Before I get started though, I want to remind everyone about our Father's Day knife giveaway. Remember, come to the Heritage Center and when you come for your visit, mention Skip Rowell's uh, art exhibit and you can put a ticket in for the knife giveaway, which will be held right here on Trail Talk on June the 16th. So uh, you, you wanna get in on that. That is a, it is a super cool knife. Look at our website, our Facebook page. There are pictures. Um, it sure make a nice gift. Also remember that we have our uh, hours have expanded. Now we're open Tuesday through Sunday from 10 to five. So come on by here. The kids are getting out of school. This is a great place to visit. We have a lot of fun things going on. So how about if we get started on our trail talk? Look, look at this little face. Is that the cutest thing? I love raccoons. Now, before I get into all the interesting information, I have to tell you, I had a pet raccoon. It's not something you should do. Okay, I, I teach against this all the time, but I had a pet raccoon. His name was Rascal, and I'm going to talk about things that raccoons do, and he did all of these things. Mm -hmm. He was a rascal. Um, so they have the distinctive markings. We're all familiar with the ring tail and this little black, looks like a mask, look, like a little bandit on their faces. Um, they're just as cute as they can be, but they're, they're wild animals. Now, um, the raccoon was um, selected to be our state fur bearer in 1989. So he's been on the list for a while. Now, um, the, the North American raccoon, which is the one that we're familiar with, is um, it's the scientific name is Procyon Lotor, and Lotor is Latin for washer, because you've you're, you've probably seen videos of raccoons. It appears that they wash their food. They and we were kind of mean to our little rascal raccoon. We would give him sugar cubes because he did dip whatever he ate, he put it in water and would kind of wash it and the sugar cube will dissolve. So it's no wonder that rascal did what he did later. He became more rascally after a few of those. Um, there are seven species of raccoons, five of which are tropical. Uh, one lives in the Yucatan and our friend is called the Aro Arokin, Arokun, Arokun probably. It is a, um, let me find the, right. It's an Algonquin Native American word. So um, I, I struggle a little bit with the pronunciation, but it's that word is where raccoon kind was kind of derived from. I think it's probably an English man's uh, interpretation of a Native American word. So um, <clears throat> they are classified as carnivores, but they are actually omnivorous. They'll eat berries and um, seeds and other little plants. Plus you all know they'll eat the heck out of garbage and dog food and cat food. So they'll, they'll eat just about anything. Um, Generally, they live in a forest or a marshy area, um, but they, they live in the plains and they also thrive in urban areas, which is um, why the number one way that raccoons are killed or die is by being hit by cars because they, they are um, nocturnal, they look for food at night, uh, they raid garbage cans at night, and they find themselves on the roadway and they end up being hit by cars. Um, in the wild, they live about six years and weigh roughly 20 to 25 pounds. So um, their, their claws are very finger-like 
and they're, they are very clever with how quickly they learn or adapt to um, solving puzzles that they, that they find in their way. I guess you could say, for instance, I'll refer to Rascal again. Rascal figured out how to unlatch the cage that we kept him in. He um, would let himself out at night and would come back the next morning. And we found out when we would go and the cage would not be latched back. So we knew somebody was unlatching it, but not latching it back. And he would hop in and, and pull the, the little opening shut, but he would not latch it back. So we figured out that Rascal was quite a little rascal. Um, now, most raccoons live solitary lives, but they will come together in a den of sorts to, uh, to kind of look for food together. The, the uh, young stay with their mothers for a while. Um, another reason you should not make a pet of a raccoon is because they do carry diseases that humans can catch. So it's, um, it's best to kind of stay clear of them. Um, they mate in late winter and the, there are generally four to five kits, which is what you call the babies born in April or May. And then they'll stay with their mother into the fall. So it's, you know, but from the time that um, she becomes pregnant until the, the kids are born and then they're big enough to leave her, you know, it's about nine or 10 months probably. Uh, in severe winter climates, the raccoon will become dormant but not hibernate. So um, they, they are not hibernating animals. Now, this is something I did not know. Raccoons were hunted very aggressively in the 1800s. You guys know what I'm talking about if I say Davy Crockett or Daniel Boone and their coonskin caps. Um, because of the, the fur being so water repellent and uh, warm for people to wear, it, they became, uh, that became a common clothing item and raccoons were killed um, until almost extinction. And finally, uh, you know, the powers that be put a tax on the coon skins themselves, um, which resulted in people backing off of killing them. It was estimated that more than a million raccoons were killed each year for their fur, which I just find that to be astounding. Um, but they have made a remarkable comeback. And so we are really glad they live in, you know, in the deep woods, caves, tree hollows, ground burrows, they'll live in almost any situation. I mean, there's been even a raccoon family on the street in my neighborhood, there's like a little culvert thing. And I have seen the mama raccoon down in there and with some of her babies, I've seen them crossing the street even in the evening time. So they absolutely come to urban areas. And why? Because people have taken over their habitat. We have eliminated uh, places for them to live, ways for them to find food. And so in their desperation, their attempt to survive, they will come to urban areas, populated areas. And so they, they're gonna be around. So if you see a raccoon, enjoy it from a distance, let the raccoon live its happy life because rascal, the very rascally raccoon, um, got out of his cage one night and did not come home. And then our chickens began to die and we put a trap out and there was Rascal in the trap. He was coming back to kill our chickens. It's what I teach here at the Heritage Center. Wild animals are meant to be wild animals. The instinct that they have to hunt and find food is just in them. And so even trying to domesticate one and make a pet out of it 
it just doesn't work. So anyway, that's my sad but true story about Rascal the Raccoon, but don't we have the cutest fur bearer of any state? I think we do, the raccoon. Okay, we're gonna learn about our state fruit, the strawberry. Anyone else's mouth watering out there? I love strawberries. And um, there was a lot of really cool information about strawberries that I didn't know. But uh, the strawberry was recognized as our state fruit in 2005 when fifth grade students from Skyatook Intermediate Elementary held an election to choose the state fruit. And the winner was the strawberry. And so their teacher, Pam Bell, asked Representative Joe Sweden to sponsor the bill and it passed. And there we have it, our state fruit. So um, you guys, maybe you've heard of Stillwell. Oklahoma. It's kind of the strawberry capital of the state. For 60 years, they've had an annual festival to celebrate strawberries. And um, you know what? Look it up online and go check that strawberry festival out. I think that that sounds like a really fun thing to go do. Um, Delaware, Louisiana, and North Carolina also recognize the strawberry as one of their state symbols. They are very high in vitamin C. Here's the reason to eat them, besides the fact that they're just delicious. They're high in vitamin C and vitamin A, and they supply 8% of the recommended daily allowance of iron. I did not know that, but that makes me very happy and makes me want to go eat some more strawberries. Um, one cup of strawberries has only 60 calories and zero grams of fat. What need I say more? I'm telling you, there is absolutely no reason to say no to a strawberry unless of course you're allergic. And um, I'm sorry for you. I have a couple of food allergies and so I feel your pain, but that's not one of mine, so I'm gonna eat some. So the garden strawberry, that's the variety of strawberry we are all most familiar with. It's a widely grown hybrid species. And of course they're delicious, fresh or frozen. Um, people use artificial strawberry flavorings and scents for you know, everything from candy to jellies or syrups, they, they use them for soap, lip gloss, perfume, I mean, all sorts of things. So strawberries are, you guys love strawberries? Anybody? We had some, we had some students walking past. Nobody answered me. <laughs> I think they do though. I think they love them. So the first garden strawberry was bred in Brittany, France in the 1750s. So that was a, that was a very long time ago, you know, the 18th century. Uh, and prior to this, wild strawberries were cultivated and uh, that was the common uh, fruit. Um, strawberry was mentioned in ancient Roman literature in reference to its medicinal uses. So that's kind of interesting. And the French began making the strawberry, taking strawberries from the forest to their gardens as early as the 14th century. So, I mean, Strawberries, in, in fact, they were found in Italian, Flemish, Ger and German art and in English miniatures. So people have adored strawberries for centuries. And, um, you know, that attests to the um, amazing deliciousness of their flavor. Plus the entire strawberry plant has been used to treat depressive illnesses. So listen, I. I cannot find anything wrong with the strawberry. Great choice, Oklahoma. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the strawberry is, here's some bad news for you maybe if you're kind of hung up on little things like that. It's not actually a berry per se. Okay, technically it's an aggregate accessory fruit. And that just go, refers to all the little seeds that are in the strawberry and um, how that's part of the reproductive system of the fruit. So that's, that's the only little thing, you know, if you're ever playing trivia and that comes up, <laughs> there's one for you. 
In 2017, a few years ago, world production of strawberries was 9.2 million tons. And China came in as the top producer with 40% of the strawberry production. So uh, well done, strawberries. Keep your reign as fruit of Oklahoma. And uh, I'm going to go enjoy some of this when I leave here. OK. Next, we're gonna talk about our state crystal. Now, this is one maybe you had not considered. Um, it's the hourglass selenite. Now, the hourglass is referring to this shape inside the crystal, okay? That looks like an hourglass. Uh, th this, is, this is a very interesting, um, one, one of the more interesting uh, state symbols, I think. So, in 2005, this was named our state crystal. Selenite is a crystallized form of gypsum, and it can be found in Oklahoma's Great Salt Plains. Uh, so selenite is a common, uh, selenite crystal, I guess is common, but the hourglass is um, only found in the Great Salt Plains of Oklahoma. So that makes it unique to our state. The idea to declare our glass selenite a state symbol was proposed by students from Bryant and Red Oak Elementary Schools in Moore, Oklahoma. So uh, selenite um, is chemically hydrous calcium sulfate. It's a common mineral that takes on a great variety of crystal forms and shapes. But on the salt plains, the crystals are formed just below a, the salt encrusted surface. So every, the conditions have to be just right for these crystals to form. And if it rains too much, crystals that have formed might completely dissipate and then reform when the conditions are right again, which I, I found to be kind of interesting. Um, they, but they're seldom found deeper than two feet below the surface. I don't know if you can go to the Great Salt Plains and look for them. You know how you can go look for rose rocks and things like that? I don't know, but it, it might be a fun little activity to go do sometime if that's possible. So crystals take on the characteristics of their environment. The finer the soil, the more clear the crystal. And it's the iron oxide in the soil that gives the crystals their chocolate brown color. Um, but this is actually from, formed from the sand and clay of the Oklahoma soil um, that ends up making this unique design within the crystals. Um, this is not found anywhere else in the world, only in the salt plains of Northwest Oklahoma. I just think that is super cool. Mm -hmm. So um, exceptional individual crystals have uh, been found measuring up to as long as seven inches, um, along with some complex combinations. I don't know if you guys have ever seen like one of those rose rocks that looks like a whole bunch of little rose rocks, but they're all kind of meshed together in one big giant one. Well, that's what has happened with these crystals. And there was one that weighed 38 pounds, which is, that seems like a pretty big crystal. Uh, so again, um, this is unique and a beautiful thing grown. I mean, they talk about crystals almost as though they're living beings because they talk about them growing, but only found in Oklahoma. And as long as there is, um, let's see, uh, brine conditions, which means like the salt, eat, the salt, the gypsum and saline and soil, and the amount of water just all has to be just right and they will grow sometimes very quickly. And, and if you wanna see one really unique, come to Oklahoma and look for our hourglass selenite. All right, now the last state symbol I want to introduce you to is the astronomical object. That seems like a very far-fetched state symbol, doesn't it? Well, it's very new to our state symbols. It was only adopted um, in 2019, let me get the, on April 16th, 2019. 
um, in House Bill 1292. So it's, it's very new to our list of symbols. Um, <clears throat> the Rosette Nebula is in the Monoceros region of the Milky Way galaxy. It's, it's only about 5,000 light years from Earth. So, you know, um, yeah, the cluster and nebula uh, measure roughly 130 light years in diameter. So, you know, it take a little time to go across it. Um, and the radiation from young stars, I'm gonna get into that a little bit more, excite the atoms in the nebula, causing them to emit radiation, producing the nebula that we see. And Rosette, I think you get the idea. It, you could kind of say it resembles a rose. And that's our state flower. Our state rock is the rose rock. So, you know, this, I'm, I mean, I, I kind of get why they would choose this to be uh, as one of our state symbols. Um, the mass of the nebula is estimated to be about 10,000 solar masses. So if you're not familiar with light years or solar masses, neither am I. It's bigger than a bread box. I'm just going to go with that. This thing is massive, y'all. Uh, it's, it's really, really big. So um, in, inside this nebula, there are numerous newborn stars. So it's like a little baby star incubator of sorts. It creates new stars. Um, and approximately 2,500 young stars are in this complex. I'm, I'm sure you have to have some kind of crazy strong uh, telescope to be able to see this and really appreciate it. Um, most of the star formation activity is occurring in the dense molecular cloud to the southeast of the bubble. So I'm gonna guess this is the southeast, the, I mean the bubble and the southeast, then maybe it's the darker part over here. I'm, I'm not really sure. I'm, I'm not an astronomer, so I don't, I don't know a lot about this. Um, so there is a, a diffuse of X-ray glow seen between the stars in the bubble, and that's attributed to a super hot plasma. I hope this is really appealing to all you space nerds out there. <laughs> With temperatures ranging from one to 10 million K, which I believe is Kelvin from on the Kelvin scale. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but listen, it's one to 10 million whatever's in some kind of super hot plasma. So um, no, you couldn't touch it. Okay, that's not gonna, that's not gonna happen. Um, so I have another picture I wanted to show. I found this on um, a website called the Astrographer and his name is Trevor Jones. And this is a picture and he drew some familiar, um, uh, what, what are these? Uh, constellations. So here's Taurus, Orion, Canis Major, and here's Monoceros. This is the, um, the uh, constellation. And so here's the Rosette Nebula. So for those of you who are stargazers and like to um, find things like this in the night sky, this is a little bit of a map that will help you do that. And so right in there is the Rosette Nebula. Probably pretty easy to see <laughs> right in the armpit of Monoceros right here. <laughs> uh, yeah, oh, Orion, yeah, there you go, right there. He's just got his arm there. That's right there. So um, there you can find our state symbol, the Rosette Nebula. Um, and so, that is a wrap on Oklahoma State Symbols Volume 8 for today. I'm so glad you guys could join us. If you have any questions or comments, please um, just ask away. Give us some more information. I'm always excited to learn new things, and we'll have all that uh, available on Facebook. So um, anyway, thanks for joining us today, and I will see you next time. And so happy trails. Happy trails.